we go. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Business of Strength podcast. Today's episode is all about finding your ideal client. In this episode, Dan and I will discuss the importance of identifying and finding your ideal client. We'll show you how finding the right clients can pay huge dividends and skyrocket your gym, while the wrong ones can help burn it to the ground. In this, sto- this we're going to tell you our story of how we f- were able to focus on a single ideal client that helped define our business, how Varsity House started with a single ideology and a single group of people, and then grew and expanded upon that from there. Welcome to the Business of Strength, powered by Varsity House Gym, the podcast for strength entrepreneurs. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Business of Strength podcast. I'm Coach Joe Riggio, here with my partner, Dan Goodman. Trevor Lang on the ones and twos. Yeah, yeah. We were barely able to get our ass to, in gear today and get this podcast rolling. We had about 40 outtakes on the intro alone, so hopefully we don't screw this up too bad. Today we're going to be talking about finding your ideal client and how uh, niching down to a specific group of people can actually be the best thing you, you do. You know, Most gym owners, maybe as a new business, think that we need to take anyone and everyone but in the end, uh, as the saying goes, if everything's important, nothing's important. So by niching down and kind of singling your focus in on a particular group, you can actually help yourself tremendously and, and grow your business the way you want to with the right clients and the people that you want to work with. So uh, if there's one thing that I'm certain after 20 years in the fitness industry is that the right clients will really help drive your business to the stratosphere and the wrong ones can really help cripple it. Um, I, I know we've talked about it a lot and as you know, we, we say it all the time, you know, oh, oh, you know, there's only one bad apple to spoil the bunch. And how many times have you talked to gym owners or Dan and, and we've had people here at the gym and just say to us, Oh, if I only had 10 or 15 more clients like this person, if I only had 10 more people like this, if I only had a few more like that. Right. And, uh, you know, the gym industry, the box gym industry, the private gym business is really, you know, hangs their hat on community. So, your community is really, you know, what matters most and in, in a sense drives everything else. You know, strong community, strong sales, strong community, strong commitment to your programs and stuff like that. You know, so so building your building the right community starts with finding the right clients and kind of attracting this Definitely. like these a group of like minded people. And and I don't know, like it, maybe the analogy that I, I could use here is like I don't know, like a bar, right? Like you go to some, you go to you go to one bar, and it's like a biker bar, and it's like you know a little rough, right? And you go in there, and it's like a bunch of bunch of biker dudes with beards and earrings, and, and like and, Sarge, right? Like Sarge, right, with his leather pants and his and his you know and his Hell's Angels jacket, okay. And, or you go to another place, and it's like you know, it's like high tea in there, and it's like you know everybody's sipping on sipping on uh, 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 you know mai tais and freaking you know uh, uh, you know. Um, you know, Bloody Marys and stuff like that, and having their fancy drinks, like the tea and martini, yeah, like the tea bar at the at the Grand American they in Salt threw, Lake. They threw us out of there quick. There was a, there, I wanted to play the harp. <laughs> I was, I, I didn't think that was a, such a big deal, and maybe wrestling in the hallway was the was yeah. the problem. <laughs> so, so, so you know, so you have two stark differences there, and maybe those communities don't mix well together. You know what I mean? So. A lot of gyms is what you'll see is, especially in the health club business, is that there's clicks, you know, and you have like the, you know, super health nuts in one corner doing their, you know, crazy, stupid health club workouts, you know, doing stuff that I've never seen anywhere. You have the, you know, the house mom group. You have the, you know, the uh, the string string uh, tank top group in the back with the fanny packs, you know, the 80s leftover crew. And there's always like kind of like clicks of people in the gym, but in a small business like this, because we're all kind of grouped together all the time, building a, a, a real strong community with like-minded people is, is critical. And they kind of feed off each other, you know, like we see it here all the time where like, you know, the mob, you know, mentality is like, oh, wh- who's who's doing the six-week transformation? And it's like, you know, everybody's waiting to see who else is going on. And then a few people raise their hand, and all of a sudden it's like a like a domino effect and yeah. a whole bunch of people wind up signing up and they talk themselves into doing stuff in the gym. I think also too, like, you know, I know it's cliche to say, but the vibe attracts the tribe. Of course. But there'll always be some outliers to the community where sometimes they're great additions to the crew, but as a leader and as a coach, you need to, it's your job to help them feel 
important and feel like they're part of your crew and your community. A lot of times people, you know, it's easy as a coach, I'm just, I'm speaking from a, a coaching perspective to be on the floor and you have your five or six A plus clients and all of a sudden two new people show up to class and, you know, they might dress different. They might not have your gear on. They sure. not, might not be in tune with the lingo and how you coach a class. And a lot of times people tend to shy away from those people yeah. when those are the people that you need to be spending the most time with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people just, I think, misunderstand that and, um, you know, have to really, you have to go above and beyond in the inclusion process for those people that might not be or might not appear to be that avatar client yeah, that sure we're for. i mean we, we i mean i think we do a good job of that uh during our onboard um and or during any of our new special events where we generally try to partner in a new client up with one of our a plus veterans so Definitely. you know like if i got a new a new guy coming into train and he looks like he's you know cool dude big strong guy used to be an ex-athlete maybe i'll partner him up with frank or brad or something like right. that and then and and it's like hey man like you know this is frank he's been here for years he's going to show you what's up you just watch him right. and he's going to be your you know your liaison and that's the also why today. we started the vhu process here to circumvent that problem because that yeah. was a problem that we were having where a lot of people were just dropping by to do a class and jump in and free workout and uh, obviously that was not working well for retention is when we started to instill our VHU process, which allows you to do one thing, and that's coach well. And even more impor importantly than that is to help you build a relationship with that Absolutely. client. Absolutely. So so finding your ideal client starts a lot with yourself first, you know, and, and one of the one of the key components to finding your ideal client uh, is, you know, what we'll call know thyself. And, and you have to have a really clear vision of who you are, what your what your gym or gym business stands for, and, and what you really want to do and what you want to be known for. So clearly uh, deciding on your vision, and we've talked at nauseum about vision and vision planning and setting up your core values and things, um, but having a set of core values and a mission statement and a, a clear and defined purpose that is aligned with your business um, that you – and your coaching staff and your sales staff or your front desk staff, whoever it might be, can clearly uh, discern and spit out and speak to clients at a moment's notice is critical. If you're out with clients or your, or your employees are out and about in the community and a client asks them about the gym and they have no real... Um, definitive standpoint as to what you do and what, in particular, what you are that's better and or more unique than your competitors around you, that it's you're just another face in the crowd, another gym, another place to go. I don't know about, you know, where everybody else is that's listening to the podcast, but here in, you know, the North Jersey, New York metro area, there are thousands, not hundreds, not tens, there are thousands of gyms in you know, the 30 or 40 mile radius that's around us. You know what I mean? If you drive from Southern Bergen County to Eastern Bergen County to Northern Rockland County to NYC, obviously it was right down, right across, the, you know, the river here. Um, you know, you're talking thousands of gyms, everything from yoga studios to giant box gyms to everything. So you have to have something unique. And like for us, our core values, you know, hungry, humble, and committed to excellence our mission statements and so forth, and the fact, you know, we can clearly define what we do. Varsity House provides high-level performance coaching for athletes, their families, and the health-conscious community. You know, our, our, our sole purpose is to give our athletes and their families the best hour of the day to improve their lives on and off the field. And if you can't talk like that and you don't know it inside and out and believe it, and it's really part of who you are, that's the first step. That's the one thing you have to fix. Joe, the one thing I want to... Um and I can almost even put you on the spot here a little bit with this, sure. but that and, and our ethos statement has definitely expanded. Oh, no doubt. You no know, doubt. so like, like when we first started, it wasn't nearly as clear, but we, we, we've always had, in a sense, a, a, we've always used catchphrases. We've always used the ethos. We've right. always had, we so had, you know, other things. My too. question to you in 2006, when you yeah. first started the gym, yeah. what was your message and, in terms of knowing thyself, who were you trying to train? So, I mean, in, when we started in 2006, it was athletes and athletes only. So for us, it was, and, and out of that, I would say, you know, a solid 
you know, 80 to 90% of them were football players. Okay. So we had one clear mission was, you know. And that's it. And, you know, obviously we're going to get down to, you know, I don't want to jump around here, but when you talk about, when we talk to a new strength entrepreneur, so many of them have the issue of just trying to do and be too many things to too many people. Yeah, of course. And that's a major problem. And you see our staff here, you know, we've, we've um, integrated certain people that have strengths that you and I do not have Correct. to create a, um, you know, a military training program, a nutrition program, a basketball training program. Not yeah. that we can't do those things, but that's that person's job. That's that person's specialty. So it's allowed us to broaden our horizons a little bit while still, you know, coming back and and holding true to our original sentiment to be... Yeah, you know, so, I, I mean, I remember for myself, and, and I'll just, I'll speak for me, and then I'll, and then I'll you know, kind of give them the quick version of how things went down with me and you, but, like, you know, I love sports. I played sports. I thought training athletes was cool. I, I had trained regular population adults in the process of educating myself, and I had done some in-home training at people. And let me tell you something, when you're training some, you know, not the ideal client that I was looking for, you know, <laughs> person in their basement, and you're basically, you know, in a sense, their indentured servant, I said, this was the worst hell that I could ever live in. This is pretty much Dante's seventh layer of hell. I was being eaten, I was in the mouth of the beast, right, being eaten alive every, you know, three times a week for about a year, but I had to make money, you know. And, and on the side, I had some athletes that I trained. And it was no, it was a no brainer. You know, here's a couple fourteen year old kids that want to work that I'm doing cool shit with, and I'm doing med ball throws, and we're jumping, and we're sprinting, and we're doing fun stuff out at the field, or I'm in the basement listening to how you know your hundred thousand dollar car sucks, and your life sucks, and your new Cartier watch sucks, and you know my husband sucks, and my wife sucks, and I was like, well, that's the end of that. You know, I don't want nothing to do with any of that. You know, and obviously, you know, from coming from a sports background. I was training you and a whole bunch of your cronies, and everybody played football. We all had that bond. And when me and you sat down, it was like, well, what do we want to do? Well, let's just stick to what we're good at. You know what I mean? Let's just, we know football. We have connections with football coaches and athletes. Let's just, you know, abuse the shit out of those connections and, and the kids that we do know. And, you know, Dan had the little brother who was playing. He knew a bunch of coaches in the community. He himself went to go coach uh, 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 for a couple years, and you were coaching uh, uh, for a few years. And, and through that community, we, you know, established ourselves as, you know, one of the, you know, top performance gyms Leading in the country. in strength and conditioning. In football strength and conditioning, right, but, primarily, yeah. But the results spoke for themselves where yep. their parents and their friends and their family members were like, okay, like, whatever they're doing over there is working. And it created a buzz. It created a sense of urgency to come and check us out and see what we were doing. Right. So when I started in 2006, you know, that was right at the cusp, like right at the beginning of CrossFit getting going. Right. And, and a lot of people had asked us, you know, when we, when we partnered up in 09, like, are you, you know, you guys, what do you think about CrossFit? What do you think about CrossFit? You know what I mean? And you know, good or bad, I think I think if we had opened up a CrossFit gym back then, that me and you being us would have been very successful, and you know we probably would have been in on the beginning sort of what is now a giant fitness movement and has you know really done well for the entire industry. But um, you know now now when there's CrossFit gyms literally across the street from each other a, in certain towns and they're popped up everywhere and there's four or five of them in a local demographic, um, you know right around here, right around us, within a mile or two of us, there's like four or five of them. And forget about going down into Paramus where it's really busy. There's like 12 of them. So, you know, now, you know, in, in depending on your market, that might not be a great option. So for us, you know, at the time, there was only one or two other gyms doing really, you know, well, I, I, I'm going to say it. There was only one other gym in the local area doing really good sports performance training. And that was probably Joe DeFranco and, and Joe's gym in, in uh in Hawthorne, and you know, Joe's obviously one of the top trainers in the world, and he had a place, you know, within about a half an hour from us. But we were going after different markets and stuff like that, and you know, there's plenty of business for everybody. And Joe was a top-notch coach, and we ne we never really stepped on each other's toes at all. And there was a lot of gyms in the area uh, that had come and gone. There was a few people who tried, but nobody who was really successful. So I think just by, you know, by dialing in and 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 knowing what 
it's going to make you the happiest too, right? And it's going to say like, wow, that's this is what I love to do every day. Like you got to be able to show up and love what you do. And that starts with kind of being realistic with yourself. Like I want to make money too. And I think if me and Dan had just opened up the floodgates, um, we probably would have made a lot more money up front, but I think a lot less over the long haul. Definitely. Because we would have at some point two or three years in, maybe we would have got a bunch of cash up front, but then it's like, well, what are these guys? Because we can't compete with some of the big gyms and things like that. And 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 there was other you know, so so by niching down and and knowing ourselves and knowing what we were good at, what we want to do, and clearly defining our in a sense at that point we didn't have nearly the business savvy that we do now. But you know, by having, you know, a, a set of core values and, and a mission statement that was specific to working with athletes, I think that set us apart from a lot of the competition because everybody who I know who tried, tried to go to, into too many things too fast and then became, you know, a, let's call it a, you know, C minus across the board. You know what I mean? It was never really great at anything. So uh, second thing is know your competition. And I don't mean by trolling your competition on Facebook and Instagram and like, you know, hate commenting all their stuff and things like that. But I'm, you know, if there are other gyms that you see that you want to be like, like if you're if you're a listener and you're saying, I want to be I want to open up my own varsity house. Well, you got to know what we're doing. You mean, you got to take a look at what we're doing. How are we presenting ourselves? What are we doing good? What are we doing bad? There's still plenty of things that we're screwing up. What are the holes in what we're doing? Like, so knowing your competition is helping you know yourself. So by studying the gyms and people that are successful out there and people in your area to see how the, how and what they're doing well, you might A, find some holes in their game that you can exploit to create your own niche, or B, find it in a completely different avenue that doesn't exist in your market. So like for us up here in the northern, northeastern, you know, corner of Bergen County, Rockland County, there were no sports performance gyms. And, and so in and this area, uh, if you don't know it, is quasi-demographically isolated. You know, it, it's once you're in the valley, you know, it's a half hour ride out of the valley, right? So... You are you were we and we were demographically isolated, so we won by default. Uh, not you know not not by any you know we definitely knew we wanted to be in this area, but it wasn't like we were thinking of all those things when we first started. Definitely you know? not. And uh, and and so so by being in the right you know be, by watching the competition, by studying what they're doing, by seeing who they're going after. You know, if you want to be the best football trainer in your area, and there's another sports performance gym who already has all the football teams in your area, you're probably, you're probably going to have a tough time. You either need to find a new area or you need to find a new niche, you know? So, you know, some of the things, you know, an example might be like, you know, you know if, if there's a Globo gym in your area, I wouldn't go open up another Globo gym. How are you going to compete with them? You know, most like 24-hour fitness, they're working on, a, you know, a mega million dollar budget, you know? So, you know, you have to look at your, your community first and, and not what you exactly want to do but also like you know yeah maybe i want to open up a crossfit box well are there six of them in your town you know what i mean so maybe open up another crossfit box might not be the best thing to do so you know knowing your competition is really uh, uh keeping an eye on who they work with what they're doing where the holes in their in their game are and, and what areas of fitness and or sports performance can you exploit that there are that they're not that they're not doing so, um, number three, we have do your homework, right? Uh, we, this is one of my pet peeves because it's amazing to me uh, how many strength entrepreneurs are out there at, who know so much about training but don't know squat about business and or the industry as a whole. And there's, those are three completely separate things. So, most coaches spend the majority of their time studying strength and conditioning. Then what's left over, they'll a business book or two. Then if there's anything left over, they're usually not, it's food related. Like me. Right? right? But but we like nobody studies industry this this stuff. Morning. Like Trevor and I were t- literally talking about this this morning where a lot of strength and conditioning coaches are almost like uh, anti-sale, you know, like anti-business yeah. until they absolutely need to make money. And it's like, to me, if you're a strength and conditioning coach that's training people out of a basement or a small garage or whatever, you got real low overhead, but you have another job, 
to me, no offense, you could know a lot about strength and conditioning, but you're not a strength and conditioning coach by profession. That's not what you do. And no. I know Trev. No, you're just a part time coach you're making a, a couple coach, bucks. So it doesn't matter. But when 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 this is our career and we have ten plus coaches that rely on varsity house gym to pay the bills solely, yeah. you bet your ass that we need to sell. Yeah. And and if we're not selling, that falls the, the onus is on us. Correct. To make the sales and um and making money and having money to support your family does not equate to selling out. You know, you could still be a great coach and spend a shitload of time uh, continuing your education and, and upping your training level um, and become a great salesperson. Yeah, I mean, this is a little off topic, but like that, we get a lot of that when we talk about systems and sales processes and having sales scripts and things like that. And people are like, oh my God, it sounds like so corporate. And I'm like, I'm like, well, look, you you either treat your business like a real business, or it's not going to treat you <laughs> the way you want it to. It's never, it will never mm-hmm. be what you want it to be if you don't, you know, take hold of the business side of things. Now, I get it. You know, we're, we're you know, people are like, well, about the community, the blah, blah, blah. Well, I think Varsity House as a brand is stronger now than it ever was. Will it ever be what 184 Central was, or will it ever be what? You know, 234B industrial was the way back days. You know what I mean? No, but it's better. We have better coaching. We have better programming. We have better equipment. We got a way better facility. We got better systems. The entire process of being a client or athlete here at Varsity House is so much better. The overall experience from the second you walk in the door... And I, when you walked in the door to see me, it was like, yo, what's up, Joe? And it was like me with my notebook. And it was, yes, it was dirty, hard, you know, underground training. But there was no process. There was no experience. It was like we, it, the experience was where well, you're going to sweat to death in this hell hole because there's no air conditioning. You know, so so by doing your homework, what I'm talking about is that the industry is loaded with industry magazines, conferences, and gurus like us, right, who, who you know, are – you know, helping people. And there's a ton of industry magazines and industry publications like Club Industry, Athletic uh, uh, Development, Athletic Business uh, Magazine, Club Solutions, Idea Fit. And these are all huge organizations that not only have conferences and, and provide resources for gym owners, but also, um, you know, compile ridiculous amounts of statistics and things like that. So by, by I still read uh, club industry, idea fit, and athletic business every single month, and and I get a lot of insight. Now, some of the stuff, like the last episode, was you know how to build out an aquatic center. Like, oh, okay, like I wish I had the money to build out an aquatic center. Trevor wants an aquatic center. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> a kitty slide, a tiki bar, right? A margarita station, right? So, but the reality is that not everything applies, but I pick up four or five good things in every magazine and you see what the trends are, like what's trending hot, what's trending not. You know, cro- you know most people are on this CrossFit kick, but most people don't realize that you know, over the last two years, CrossFit's, the number of CrossFit, new CrossFit gyms opening has severely declined. You know, I want to know why. If I'm going to open up another CrossFit gym or I'm a CrossFit person, I'm thinking about that. Well, I'm starting to think like, well, what are the roadblocks there? What are, what's missing that people, that they're not moving as fast, that they're losing traction in a sense? So those are some of the things. You got to keep your finger on the pulse. You got to look for trends and opportunities. Um, you got to see what, what else is out there. Also, by going to some of these conferences, you get to network. I mean, and that's a huge part of it. So you get to yeah. meet other great coaches and business people like we have. And we've gotten tons of great ideas. I mean, look at—I mean, we did a podcast with Josh, you know, just recently, and Josh was doing a bunch of great, you know, impl- uh, um, client surveys that have really helped him narrow the focus to what he wants to do with his gym. And, and it really—and we just thought it was a great idea because we'd never done it. One and two, it was a great way to empower our clients and, in a sense, give them a voice. Definitely. So I learned something from you, Josh, and I learned something from our business strength community, and that's a great example of why you need to do your homework and get out in the industry. And, and and you got to get outside of your little niche too. It Definitely. can't just be like I don't. We just don't go to like powerlifting and sports performance no. seminars. It's mostly business. It's, it's broad. It's, it's yeah, broad yeah. spectrum. Another thing too, um, when we speak to strength entrepreneurs, is a lot of them will say, and we we you know we probably hear this at least once a month. I don't have time. I don't have time to get to a two day seminar. I have too many customers. I have too many clients. I have too many sessions to account for. And the funny thing is, is that 
I used to say the same exact thing. Like go on a ski trip. Right. Take vacation. Course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and it's like, you know what? If that's your vacation, like you want to, you know, plenty of times we've tacked on a day or two to our conferences. Bo- our boy Bernardo took an entire week yeah. vacation to come here. But here's the thing, too, is that when Joe and I or Mike or Trevor or Adam or Sarge or Simone, whoever, it is required here that you must do continuing educa- education credits every single year, and we pay for half of it. But... Here's the thing. Every single time that somebody leaves the gym here, our community, they want to know about it. They want to know what you learned. They want to know the new exercises. They want to see the pictures. They want to follow along. So it's um, by doing that, you're you're upping the level of your uh, of your client experience and and you're and you're giving yourself, you know, a moment of reprieve to be creative when you're outside of your space. It's amazing. The creative thought processes that you can that you can have, and uh, and the amount of steps your business can take forward. I yeah, mean. I mean, me and you have had some of our best brainstorms traveling together, and just oh, yeah. being out of the gym, and and you know, and uh, you know, being out of you know in Utah or whether we, when we were you in get Florida. Stuck in stuff Groundhog like Day. If you come and do the same thing almost day in day out for years, I mean, it's hard to be creative oh, after yeah. a certain point. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. I love, you know, getting out of the gym. You know, what, what I think we had one of our most productive, you know, advisory board meetings ever when we went out, you know, to the to the to the market and, and had, you know, a, a full day quarterly advisory board meeting out of the gym. You know, we had a blast. We ate. We had coffee. We chilled out. We all had breakfast. We had a nice time together. And it was fun to get out. And everybody everybody was creative. Everybody was just out of there. It was just more comfortable. It's like, ah, another gym, you know, no matter what, when we're in here. You know, somebody's going to bother us. Sure, there's something. external things that are happening all day. Yeah, Jim's Jim's going right now. So, uh, so you know, doing your doing your homework again. Like I said, it's about attending conferences and workshops, networking within the industry, finding out what industry leaders are up to, um, and seeing what the trends are. You know, uh, how are people doing their marketing? How are people doing their Facebook ads? How are people doing their memberships and onboarding and things like that? If you don't surround yourself with other professionals, it's hard to just envision all. All those things by yourself, you know. So get out and learn as much as you can, and, and see exactly how the best gyms are doing it and how they're marketing and making money. Okay, do your homework. Uh, number four is niche down. We talked about this in the beginning. This is the absolute key. Finding something that you are truly great at. Right. You do not want to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Having a there, there, there are a lot of um, let's call it we do everything gyms out there and they got a little bit of boxing, they got some spinning, they got some wrestling, they got some fitness type crap, they got a whole bunch of this and a whole bunch of that and they do all of it uh, very mediocre, right? And it's like I said, C C minus across the board, right? And if you're the type of client that just wants like space and fun toys to play with, that might be good for you. But the kind of clients that we're talking about, the ideal clients that we want are people that want to train a certain way, want a certain type of community, want to, want to be invested in our vibe. They want to train. They want to know that they're getting a, their, their, their money's worth. They, they're interested in what's going on physically with their body. Right. So, so One's not better than the other, though. No, I no, think I'm that's not saying important. Like for somebody that owns a health club or aspires to open a health Health club. Well, like, no, the, the, our, the client is just going to be different. You can't go after the same clients that we're going after, right. and vice versa. You know, you're looking for a different clientele. Yes, yeah. you're looking for clients who want space and stuff to do, right? And they're kind of and or or more of those autonomous clients that I don't really need any help. I just want to do some cool shit and have some fun. But in those environments, like you could that. still offer. Oh, you know, yeah. Extreme customer service where a lot of places yes. are notorious for horrible, horrible service, horrible cleanliness, horrible contracts. Yes. I mean, you yes. could still be the, the premier go to health Absolutely. club. You know? I'm not crapping on those yeah. on health clubs, sort of. But like, you know, so, but like <laughs> our clients, you know, th- when you go to a health club, there's, there is no real strength and conditioning, right? It's, it's, Fitness. It's, it's just workout. it's just working out, right? There's no real strength and conditioning. Nothing is programmed and periodized, you know. So that is in the difference. And and so for us, it's actually a harder sell to sell clients. Hey, you're going to come pay, 
you know, 200 bucks a month. And train. And train, for real. And, and explain lift weights the difference. And, all, and everything else. And, right. and, and, and they're going to be like, what? You know, I got to do all that. What are all so, these numbers? So What's for all us, this programming? So we are, you know, by us niching down, and like Dan said at the beginning, when, when we all we did was focus on athletes, and almost all of those athletes were football players. We went to all the football games. We went everywhere we could. Varsity House was known for a leader in sports performance, and for 10 years we only trained athletes, and out of those athletes, 85% were football players. Every football athlete, every football coach, and every football parent knew who we were, what we were about. And we had Varsity House football shirts made up. We had we, we used to give out shirts at all the games and stuff like that, and we still do. And, and that just gave us a distinct advantage over other gyms trying to cater to everyone. And uh, you know, our model was always, you know, this is what we do, and we're the best at it, and that's it. You know, so uh, by by f- dialing in and kind of focusing your attention in one area, um, you can be the best at something. And I don't know. I don't know any industry or any type of person in the world. Uh, and you guys could chime in on this. We could think. We could brainstorm. Think of one person who's not the absolute best at what he's doing. That isn't absolutely fucking loaded, and you know, is living his dream. Like who's 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 out there that's not the the best? Who's the best guitarist? I don't know, like John Mayer, Adam Levine, you know, uh, Joe Satriani. Uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Now he died young. He he went he went a little too far. He had a little too much fun. You know what I mean? So we're talking about people like some of the greats. You know I mean? So anybody, name anyway, great writers. You know Stephen King. You know he's doing really terrible. Let me tell you. You know so so if if you're if you strive for greatness in one thing, if you actually became the best football strength and conditioning coach in the country. I think you'd be pretty damn successful. Right. And and other opportunities arise from that. I think yes. a lot of people, well, they get, say, yeah. I know speaking for myself, is that years, like 10 years ago, I wanted to be a lot more things. I'm yeah. like, well, I, I could do this pretty well. I could do this pretty well. You know, I want to do this. I, I, and I would like to try that. And, you know, I, I I was humbled quickly when I had when I realized that I wasn't very good at any of those things and that I needed to get really good at one thing and I need and what I was good at was coaching and I I could become a very good coach and now that we've solidified ourselves as you know experts in strength and conditioning and coaching, um, other opportunities have presented themselves yeah yeah i mean that's what i was just gonna say so like you know in so let's take it from like from 2006 you know and i'll go back even further because i started training before then so you know for for the first you know decade or so of my career i was primarily focused on athletes now did i train some regular clients absolutely i gotta pay the bills right but that was not my focus that's not how i marketed myself it's not the clients that i went after i had a few because they were willing to pay me and, and and I was going to college and such, and that was just the way it was. But when the business started, when I finally opened up the first gym in 06, I trained no athletes, and I wouldn't. And I remember, you know, like when no Lance... No adults. Would, no adults, sorry. Well, no right. adults. And I remember, like, Lance bothering the hell out of me all the time about training. I wouldn't train him for, like, a solid, like, two years, maybe a year. And he kept bugging me, bugging me, bugging me, and I finally trained him. I whooped his ass so bad, he was so sore, he could barely walk for like a week. And I did it on purpose. Like, it wasn't, that was not good strength and conditioning, but I was like, I'm going to get rid of this guy because he's driving me nuts. I whooped his ass. And, you know, 12, 12, <laughs> 12, 12 years later, he's still driving me crazy, <laughs> you know. But the reality is, is that, you know, I, we had this singular focus. But because of that, we became known as this great football training facility. And then we had a ton of dads come into the gym. And, and moms and dads and, and parents hanging out at the gym. And they're like, wow, this looks awesome. You know what you should do? You should have like a little group. You should have something here for kid, for little kids. Oh, all right. We don't have little kids. Let's start doing some junior program stuff. Let's start working with like peewees, like fifth, sixth graders, seventh and eighth graders. We started doing that, right? Started making ties in with some of the local like Pop Warner teams and things like that. Hey, know what you guys should do? You guys should do like some adult classes. Well, you know, I have a bunch of moms that are, you know, we're all here dropping our kids off. Maybe we could work out, you know, going to like 2011. Dan started a little group in the morning with like four or five women that were the wives of clients and or moms of clients that we had training at the gym. And, uh, and, and, that, and that group has spawned into our adult program, which now accounts for, 
you know, nearly about 40% of the entire business, you know. So, um, and, and from that... Three people that started with. Yeah, three, three that's right. Three people, people twice a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and Diane Smith is still here, so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and... and that, so that that spawned into the adult fitness. From there, uh, once we had a little group of adults training regularly, you know, I I I, I came up with the six week transformation. And me and Dan were like, hey, let's do something cool. Let's start a special. Let's start like a body, you know, body fat, you know, weight loss, you know, getting kick ass so shape type of transformation. At twenty seven, now you know now we you know we're getting you know sixty seventy eighty people for each transformation, and uh, and they're a huge hit and they're a big part of our gym culture, and that begets another opportunity, you know, and, and so forth. So every every opportunity that we've had came from being really good at one thing first. And then people were like, hey, you guys are really, really awesome at strength and conditioning. Could Can you do fitness? Hey, can you do nutrition? Hey, can, so we've never done anything that we didn't know that we could also be really good at too. That's one thing I will say, that you have to, you have to just because opportunities – present themselves doesn't mean they're opportunities that you should take on yes. either you know what i mean 100%. so so we kept it within the wheelhouse mo- most of the time you know there hasn't really been too many things that we had to like absolutely cut or, or get rid of but you know we, we kept it in the wheelhouse we built it slow we added one new product and or service at a time and and made sure that it was delivered properly and and and, and that now has spawned into a lot of other things where you know we have multiple revenue streams, multiple businesses. I mean, the highlights business is a direct result of being really good at football training. We, right. were, we were really good with football players. We had some of the best football players in the county training at our we gym. We said coaches asking if we had film on players, and they didn't have film. So, so yeah. In so comes team money. In comes team team. <laughs> we had we had team money doing our website and some YouTube videos and stuff like that that were pretty good. We had a, I think I think T did a couple uh, gym videos that parents had saw and some of the kids saw and it was spencer colsar yeah his first yeah. one he ended up going to upenn and you know that was uh, that kind of opened the floodgates for definitely. a whole bunch of kids and that, so that's another business right there but everything related to one thing if you could trace it all back it all went back to being one thing this is the most badass gym in the yep. area for training athletes and that's really what it came down to so niche down as much as you can and and and, and that will absolutely help you uh, uh, focus in your attention and, and in your energy into one group of people, and then that group of people will be your best advocates. They'll be your marketing team. They'll be everything for you, and they will spread the gospel if you really become great at working with them. So if you want to be the best, you know, you know, let's call it transformation gym, and, and all you do is awesome, you know, eight, six, ten-week transformations, and you're this fat loss guru, go after the right clients, build that process out, kick it in the ass and make sure you're awesome at it. Everybody has an amazing experience. And then maybe if you want to start like a membership-based thing or you want to start doing kettlebell classes or you want to start doing other things, then you could have some offshoots because you've built a rapport and you have a base of people who are, you know, in a sense like living and dying your your brand and they want to be part of it at that point because now you've created this culture. And are ready so. to refer yeah, new yeah. people. Right. So that's the key. So number five is be seen and be yourself. Um, you know, I, I don't know. We've just always had an, a, a, we just always had the mindset of, of we're going to be who we're going to be and we're going to train who we're going to train and you either like us or you don't. There's plenty of business out there. There's plenty of great clients out there. Um, I'd rather have five really awesome clients than 50 crappy clients. Uh, but me and Dan knew that if we wanted to really cement ourselves, uh, in the community, that you have to be out in the community and people have to know you and, and get to know you. And they can't just see you as Coach Joe or Coach Dan that works with your kids and things like that. They got to get to know you as, a, as, as people. And, and so going out, and, you can, and we've talked about this a lot, and going out in your community and making friends with people will get you way more business than anything else out there. Right, nothing, nothing will ever replace building personal relationships. So, you know, a lot of people say to us, "Well, I mean, like, I don't want to be hanging out with my clients all day." And I, well, let me tell you, well, don't. And 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 at some point in the small gym business, you know, the box gym business, 
people are going to want, in order for them to get to know you and know who you are, believe in you, you're going to have to spend some time with them. Now, you don't have to be like up their butts all the time and like hanging out everywhere, but like going to football games, being out in the community, you know, you know, you've talked about it a lot, like, you know, trolling the, the local coffee shop all the time and calling people by their first name and getting to know, you know, even at the local Starbucks, just saying what's up to the baristas and being nice to people. And, and I and, know all their names. Yeah. Like, you know, it, the, you know, a, a thing about that too, Joe, is that people say, oh my God, like, <clears throat> you know, you're going to start a new gym, you're going to work a lot. I mean, that's no it. doubt. And if you say, look, you know, Sunday is my day with family. Okay. So then that's your day. Protect that day. That's the day that you stay home. That's the day you spend with your wife, your kids, whatever. Yep. But, you can control how you spend time with your clients by having a marketing calendar that says, hey, look, if I know that's really important, there's going to be one thing a month on this calendar where I can let my guard down as Coach Dan and I'm not coaching on the floor. That's their main interaction with me. You know, it could be, all right, uh, this month I'm going to go to the Lindhurst football game. Next month I'm going to do a 5K with my clients. The month after that we're going to have our Christmas party, our holiday party here at the gym. And, you know, there's just – it could be anything. I, I'm going to do way more than all those things. Yeah, 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 but if you feel like you're really strapped for time, if you don't put it on the calendar, it will always feel like it's being rushed. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like, oh, my God, I got to go do this, or I got invited to this party. Oh, God, I can't do that. But if you're getting invited to all these things, you could say, hey, you could easily say, hey, I can't make that, but next Friday night, I'm going to be doing this. You should really come and attend, you know? Like, yeah, and I think, like, some of the gym, like, look, you have to look at clients like they're an extension of your family, in a way, right? And and a lot of, you can't just look at them black and white like dollar signs you know what i mean you, you you have to treat people as if you really give a shit and you want to be part of their you know their lives you shouldn't be in this business no. if you don't give a shit though I mean, well there's that's... a lot of people that are there's a lot of people that that lose sight of that in lieu of you know you know lead generation and new client acquisition are such big things in the industry i where think it's... that's with people though and i'm not bashing on anybody yeah. but People that don't run a real gym, it's, I mean, you and I have been to conferences. It is so easy to sit in a room, write copy, and talk about lead generation, lead conversion, and yearly client yeah, value. Yeah, yeah. And like those things are freaking important, but it's easy to sit behind a wall and say, okay, well, you right. know what? That client's not worth it. Shh, they're out. But it, then show me. Then show me how you actually turn that into a real action plan that led to real business. Of course. Change, and also, I mean? yeah. it's like, so say you've had somebody for three years yeah. and like, you know, they lose their job. Then what? Like, you know, unless you've been in, been in and coached that person, have a real relationship with that person, it's so easy to be that business guru who doesn't run a damn gym to say, yeah. Shh, they're not worth your time. It's on to the next person. It's like, that's why you got to pick right. and choose. I mean, yeah, you, I mean there's been like, plenty of clients and athletes here. Who've come on hard times or had bad things happen to them, and I, I would never throw them Hell out. No. You know what I mean? And so, so you know, but building a real relationship, building a friendship. So you know, here's the scenario, right? I don't know. Like, you go to college, you meet a bunch of dudes on the football team, you get to talking, you get to hanging out, you go out a few times. Hey, this guy, these dudes are really cool. Like, I actually met some really cool dudes. Now one of them becomes your boy. You go to you you know you chilling, you hanging, whatever, and, and you're still friends with a lot of kids from college. I'm still friends with tons of guys from from high school and college, right? We built real relationships. Well, what's the difference here? I mean, are you telling me that if you spend time going to games and going, you're like, well, I don't want to deal with the crazy parents, right? There are going to be some crazy parents, but there's also going to be some really awesome ones, and we have, and we've met some awesome ones, and we just gravitate towards the awesome ones. So you know, I'm going to gravitate towards. You know, there, there's some really good parents, and then when I go to a game, you know, and I used to see, you know, uh, 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 you know, like Lance or a Brad or there, you know, when 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 uh, Jordan was doing track and stuff like that, and I'd go to a track meet, and Brad and Colleen would be there, I'd be like, hey, what's up, Brad? And I go hang out with them, and I and and they're awesome, and they're two of our best clients. You know right. what I mean? They're great people. So it's like, and you even know, like the business that you do, do the my friends that I grew up with that do offer a service or do sell a product because they I already trust them, like yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. For, for example, like my one friend, Jason, is a dentist. Like, who the hell do you think my dentist is? Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it's, you have to, people gravitate towards people that they trust. 
Yeah, I think it's, you know, and it's not an accident that, you know, I try to integrate my wife and, and now, you know, my son into the community. Uh, and you do the same, you know, and make Dana part of the community. And, and the girls always come for the straw man, the parties and things like that because it humanizes us, you know. And, and the women, I think, and the men that come here want to see us in, you know, just a, a regular dude kind of light. Like we're just out at the barbecue, hanging out in the backyard with our families and having a great time and talking about the same struggles and the same issues and the same things that all those people have. So it's a, a building a real relationship with your clients is the same thing as building real relationships with real people. I think we talk about yeah. this on every podcast. I mean, it's so like, important. Literally. It's so every important. I mean, so like, and again, I'm not saying that you're going to make friends. Just like, you know, I'm sure you have friends, and I know I do, who have another B squad of friends that you're not that that you're not that good of friends with. Not that you don't like them, right. but you're just like, eh, yeah, those guys are okay. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I'm not gonna throw nobody under the bus, but like, you know, I know Rob, my boy Rob's got, you know, got got a whole nother set of friends that he has, and, and they're all good dudes, but they're not my friends. You know what I mean? They're not like my close friends, and I don't dislike them, but I don't go out of my way to like, you know, hang out with them. You know what I mean? So it's the same thing here in the gym. There are, you know, a few dozen clients who are amazing, who I would literally like invite over the house and they're, you know, they, they, they've, they've, some of them have already been to the house to see the baby and stuff like that. You know, and there's a couple clients that are like, maybe, 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 maybe we don't want them over to drive you crazy, right? But like for the most part, because we've dialed in our core values, we know exactly who we are and what we're going to do because we go after a certain type of client, you, we've actually eliminated most of those clients. And I would say like before, we, be, you know, for, for years ago, before we came to the new gym, you know, there would be a couple stinkers in the group. There was a couple, there was a couple women in the group years ago who, who were bad apples, you know, who picked, who had like cattiness and like, you know, bitchiness with some of the other girls and stuff like that. And there was a few of them that we, I, I, you know, I personally had to have like a what's what conversation with. And, and, and those people wound up leaving because we didn't stand for that shit. Our, our, our gym is about, you know, you know, a uh, hard work, humility, and commitment to excellence. And if you're not humble and you can't be nice to everybody or you can't talk to other people with respect, uh, you're going to like berate. I have, you know, the one woman, you know, berating our, you know, 18 year old front desk girl. Like she didn't know shit from Shine Ola. She didn't know what it is. She's getting screamed and yelled at by a, by a, you know, by a 45 year old millionaire. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so. But also, too, like sometimes in those scenarios is that sometimes, you know, the, the, the people that, might have the facade that they're not having a good time or they're stressed out. It's like a lot of times it's just like they're they're not happy with themselves and in, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. training. And if you just go speak to them, it's funny how and, and you and you single them out after class and not that you're gonna come down on them, just see what's going on with them and you spend some time and invest some time into those people. It's funny how they could turn from what you're going to think is like an adversary to like one of your biggest fans. Yeah. Yeah, well look, I mean, there's there's an absolute truth to it. When you call people out sometimes and you call people out like my wife is I mean, if there's one thing, you know, that I respect her more than anything for, it's the fact that she has never strayed from telling me the truth, good or bad, right? Whether I want to hear it or not, I'm going to hear it, right? But the truth is is that she's not afraid to stand up to me. And she's not afraid to tell me that I fucked up or that it's something that I did something wrong or there was a flaw in my character in some way, shape, or form. And because of that, it, you know, it really like makes you think about your action. And I'm like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe I, maybe I am making her feel really uncomfortable and I need to change that. So when you call people out and you say, hey, man, like, you know, what's with the bad attitude, dude? Like, we're just having a great time. We're just working out. You know, you can't, you know, don't be, you can't, you know, don't get upset about that. You know what I mean? And you had that conversation. You're like, oh, maybe I didn't even realize I was being such a dick. You know what I mean? And that's the truth, though. It's the truth. And sometimes people just need, like, they're used to maybe, I don't know, walking around in their own world, king of their castle or whatever it might be, or however they're used to getting away and people pay. For, and I, I also think that because people pay for service, they automatically expect, like, a lot of ass kissing and things like that. And uh, and and here you, you get amazing customer service, but you got to be nice to people. You got to keep it real. You got to be fun. You got to be energetic. You got to be a positive influence for the community. Or well, we're gonna have to have a sit down. We're gonna have right. to have a conversation. You know, if you're constantly, you know, being negative, you're gonna get a talking to. No matter <laughs> how much you're willing to pay, I always find it interesting too. Like when you see, um, 
you know, you go out to a nice restaurant, you could go out for work or you go out with friends or friends of friends. It's like you could be at a really nice restaurant where the service is top notch and you see like people's true colors where they're like not that nice to the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't stand that. Who was it that we... I can't oh, stand I forget that. who oh, we. Man. I forget who it was that we talked to. Damn, it was some bigwig, but I can't remember. But he was saying, you know, um, when he does his job interviews... Maybe it was Gina Wickman's book. No, I, I can't remember. But when I mean, he does his job interviews... Oh, and he traces it back to the taxi cab driver that yes, drove him to the interview. Yes, Who the hell was that? Oh, man. I forget. That, that, he, that the last straw of their interview process is he has an in with the taxi cab driver. Yes. To see, how, to see if the person he was picking up was asked them how their day was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't stuff remember like that. Who that yeah, was. I forget who it was. But anyway, yeah. They, so they're like little clues like that, like how how you treat the regular people, like the waiter, waitress, cab, tab, cab driver, things like that, are real telltale signs of a person's true personality. So, you know, I'll give you an example here. You know, like when Dan and I started, you know, we went to every sporting event in the county. We've talked about that a bunch of times. We went out all over the place. But what started to happen was that people started to recognize us as like the go-to guys. That hey, these guys train all the football kids. And, and eventually, we met a couple cool parents and coaches, and we, we gravitated towards them, like Coach Dunn being one of them, right? And he literally became like a friend of ours, you know? And we would hang out, we'd talk football, we'd talk about the kids, blah, 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 and, and we get to know them. And then, you know, and then we go to another game, and eventually, you know, it was like, hey, what's up, Dan? What's, hey, guy, come sit with us. We're all, you know, me and a couple of dads. It's just also, proximity, right? right? So, then, so then all of a sudden, you know, hey, they're coming to invite us. Hey, we're having a little barbecue before the game. You guys want to come over, have a couple dogs, and blah, 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 blah. So we show up a few minutes early. Guys are tailgating, having some fun. Like you know, I remember going with like Marty and his dad to the BC games and stuff like that. And uh, and you know, all of a sudden we started building this little community. You know, going to the games and people started to recognize us at the games and inviting us to come to the games and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, they became friends and we were hanging out and we were doing stuff. You know, together. And next thing you know, it's like, hey man, you know what? Let me. I'm gonna really try and get you some more kids from this. And I, it's like, hey, I didn't ask. You know what I mean? I'm just being myself. Just being. You know, I'm just here. You know, being my normal self, being cool. I'm just here to party. I'm just here to party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, the one thing that I wanted to add to that, we were talking. I'm not gonna obviously blow up anybody's scene, but we were talking. There's there's somebody who's in the community here in the football community, and at the end, you know, we were talking about him yesterday, and uh, it's obvious that he he doesn't really belong, and you can tell that he's forcing himself into situations where it's like, you kind of have to ask yourself, like, do I like these people, or is this really me? Am I going to an event because I like going to the event, or is it strictly for business? And I'm, am I only trying to cement relationships? Like Dan, I know you go to games, and sometimes you like hide from customers. Like you're going there because you like going to the game. Right. You know, it's not, it's genuine. And I think the important thing is that people who are, who are at like a sporting event because they want to be there, they see right through that. If you're there only for business. It, you know, they they can tell right away, and I think you kind of have to ask yourself, like, if you hate hanging out with your clients that much, should you really be doing what you're doing? Yeah, that's I mean, a great that's, point. I though. mean, look, I mean, if you're going around the football field handing out, now me and Dan have definitely handed out flyers and stuff like that. No, uh, it was always it, on the cars. Yeah, we never we never shady to the people. I mean, we would just cars. plaster the cars. Like, oh yeah, that wasn't me. Yeah, until the cops came <laughs> after us. <laughs> I remember I remember the one time, Trev, me and you when we were well, that was me and you the when we were at PC and it was real windy. No, cease I, and desist. And and, and, <laughs> and and I remember the flyers blowing all over the parking lot and they were pissed. But anyway, but like but but we were there for the kids. And I was there to watch our athletes play. I was there to support the teams that we worked with. And and we were just genuine fans, and and that's I think you know what people saw in us. Like yeah, these are a couple of good guys. Like they, you know, they don't have to come here for three hours on a Saturday and watch freaking football. Right. And we went to a lot of junior football games too. And if anybody's watched junior football, right, you got all three levels play right after another. Could be four hours of freaking you know uh, uh, little kid football <laughs> at from seven to you know ten eleven o'clock at night on a Friday, you know and. and you know, I love football and I love the kids that we work with. But there's yeah, but there's other stuff. But we did it, and that and that's what people remember. So get out in your community, be seen, be yourself, make friends, find a few people that you connect with in your community. You got to find influencers. You got to make friends with people. Life is about networking. Uh, how many times have you heard it's more about who you know than what you know? I don't care. I don't care if you're the greatest freaking X's and O strength and conditioning coach in the world. If you cannot sell yourself. You are not going to be successful. 
in the private sector. Uh, you might be a world-class collegiate strength and conditioning coach where they feed you clients and, and you don't actually have to sell yourself in a sense. But, um, but in the private world, you're effed. All right, so our last one is just is one that we have talked about over and over and over again. And if you want more good clients, well, why not ask the good clients that you have? You got to ask for referrals. The chances are is that every gym or trainer has at least a handful of clients that they're like, I love training him. He's such a good dude. Or I love training her. She gets it. We have such a great time. It's a great hour for everybody involved. Chances you know what are I mean? those people, those magnetic personalities, have a lot of friends too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look. I mean, it, it's it, it is common sense that you know. I don't know. Let's just pick somebody. Richard Branson, right? A, a multi-billionaire owner of Virgin. He's probably got a couple other mega millionaire friends. I'd say more than a couple. Yeah, exactly. You know, probably hangs out with some powerful dudes that are the heads, CEOs, and and head influencers that sit on the boards of directors of a whole bunch of companies and things like that. You know, and and, and so if if you were like, you know, I don't know, selling aerospace, you know, technology. Maybe making friends with Richard Branson is also an into you know forty other companies and things like that. So you have to understand what you're doing now. And people say, well, you know, I I don't just make friend. You know, you can't just make a friend. Well, I'm not saying it's going to happen instantaneously, but I can honestly say that over the you know twenty years that I've been training people, that I've made a lot of really close friends in the gym, and we have some good people that we hang out with, and, and you know. Uh, and that we consider friends and that, you know, that literally come to our houses, come to our, you know, come hang out with us and go out for food and drinks and whatnot and have become a real part of our lives. So um, you have to ask the people you have. Uh, I would say that, you know, when we do, when we do you know, our, our expense reports and things like that from clients and we look at our clients, uh, you know, the, the top 100 people uh, uh, account for 90% of the money. You know, so out of out of all the clients that we have, out of the five hundred clients that we have here, a hundred of them count for most of the money, and, and and the reason is is that because those hundred clients that are really bought in, all right, and let's even take the the top fifty, and those are the re- those are the, like the hardcore, and then you look at the top ten, the numbers. When I when I when I if I printed out a report and showed most people what you know our top five people spend here a year. You know they would lose their mind. You know, we're talking we're talking fifteen twenty thousand a year plus. I mean you know and, and 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 buy all our shirts, pump our brand to their friends, right? Come to all our parties, invite us to their events, right? If they have a business and such like that, you know, go out of their way to help other community members. Go out of their way to to be part of the special events and things that we have here, right? That's the type of people you're looking for. So if you can narrow it down and start asking those people for more people like themselves, you know, uh, and in a way, you know, you know, we do it. We do it in a lot of different ways. Um, this is not an episode on referrals, but we spend about eighty percent of our time, mark uh, and all of our marketing efforts on getting our current clients to refer friends to the gym. So almost all the internal marketing that we do with all of our special events and everything is geared towards referrals, uh, not getting new clients off the streets uh, unless those new clients are referrals, right? And, and that's, that, that, that makes a giant difference because we've talked about this, I think, in, in an episode or two ago where you know, we talk about that makes them a highly qualified lead. The likelihood that that person coming from a referral of one of your top clients is has an already has an understanding of what your gym's about, already has an understanding of what your friends about, and kind of gets the vibe and is like, you know, I'm I'm into this, I'm into this, you know, and and they're gonna come. The likelihood that they're gonna assimilate into your culture way better and easier is really high. You know, we're talking about 90 percentile as opposed to, you know, 50-50. Could be I think that. something uh, that everybody needs to know is in in your gym, who is the top 10%? Like, who who are these people? Because sometimes, I know for me, when we started printing those lists, it was very surprising. Mm-hmm. And you start seeing the offset, like, oh, wow, like, 
this person was referred by this person and this re- person referred that person and like the spider web of people yeah. might from one person might equate to 25. Mm-hmm. So then that's the person that you need to say, "Hey, look, you know, I would love to uh I would love to spend an afternoon talking shop with you just about business and like let me take you out to lunch or yeah. w- you know, could you come meet with me at the gym and just talk business?" And like if you pick that person's brain and 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 really listen to what makes their experience so great, then there's a lot more business to be had by tapping into what made that specific experience so awesome for that person. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, one of the, I mean, we're about to do a, a survey. We're about to do a couple luncheons with some key clients. Um, and, and, and those luncheons are not like asking for money or anything like that. No. It's really just like, Hey, you know, let's go out. What do you think about the gym? What do you think about what's going on in the community? What what are what are some things that we can do for you? Really, is what those what it comes down to in most of those surveys and, and, and gifting our, back, right? Sure. Like so, like so, some of our some of our biggest influencers, we spend thousands of dollars around the holidays just thanking them, writing a personalized thank you card, and gifting back to say, hey, look, you know, the amount of time and energy that you put forth towards a place that you don't need to, it's not expected, you know, we really thanks so much, like, here's a free massage on us, or here's a gift card to this restaurant. And, uh, you know, I mean, every single person that comes through our VHU, just for coming and spending a month long with us, they get a gift from us, an edible arrangement. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, giving, 30, it's like $32, yeah, but it's just... Giving back to people empowers them to say, wow, like, this was an unbelievable experience. Every every single VHU that we have sold got a basket, and every single person has said something about the basket. Every single person. Thank you so much. The card was so sweet. You guys are such nice guys. We really love the gym. We love the culture. I mean, how many emails did we get this week from the six week transformation from new clients and the transformation? Be like, you guys have such an amazing community. I felt I was very nervous. I felt so comfortable. You had a great staff. Everybody was so nice to me. You know, we had a woman who wasn't feeling so good. She was, uh, you know, getting lightheaded and nauseous from from training. She hadn't trained in a long time. Everybody took such great care of her. Everybody was super nice. I called her. Dan called her. Simone called her. The front desk girls all called her and emailed her. You know, we. Send, I sent her something to her house, and it's like, hey, you're you're not alone. Don't be discouraged. We got, you. we got you. Get your ass back in the gym. You know, in two weeks you're gonna feel great. You just got to keep going. You know what I mean? And it was a real. It was like she felt like she had like some real friends. Like, oh man, you guys were so so nice. So those little details, I can't tell you how much they how much of difference they make in the overall scheme of business because one amazing client can really take your business to a whole nother level, and you never know where that's going to go, where it could be a situation where that client like winds up, hey, you know what? You know, I own two buildings down the street. Maybe you want to move your gym. You know what I mean? Like, you never know where things come from. I mean, so you never know who's who and who's got what and who knows who. There's always somebody who knows another person. So ask for referrals. Those are our key tips, okay? I'll read them through again. Number one is know yourself, right? Have a clear vision of who you are, who you want to work with, and what you want to do. Make sure you and your clients, uh, and make sure not you and your clients, make sure you and your staff can clearly explain and uh, your, your definition as to what your business is. Know your competition, number two. Make sure you keep an eye on what's going on out there and you know what other good gyms in your area are doing. Whether they're competition, true competition or not, Keep an eye on things. See who they're working on, how they're marketing themselves, what's their pro- what are they making their money on it, right? And see where the holes are and what niches there are for you to fill. Number three, do your homework. Get out in your industry and become an industry expert. One of the things that I pride myself on is right from the beginning of my fitness career, I started reading IdeaFit and Club Industry Magazine and things like that. And, and although these are not great works of strength and conditioning, I'm not learning about the craft of strength and conditioning, I was educating myself to see what other parts and segments of the business were out there, whether it was a swim club or a yoga studio or, you know, what's new in sports performance, right? There was, there's always something to be learned, and you can see kind of trends and things like that. So 
Get out and go to a workshop, go to a conference, start reading some of these industry magazines, and educate yourself in the industry as a whole as to what's going on. Uh, stop reading nothing but strength and conditioning. And besides, you get sick of that shit anyway. All right, number four, niche down. Dial in on an area or focus area of clients that you want to work with, that you feel like you have something unique to offer, and that you could stand out and be one of the best uh, offerings to that group of people. We knew we were good at training football. We had all come from a football background. Let's focus all of our attention on training football players. We became the best football training gym in our area, period. That's it. Everything else that has happened to Varsity House or all of the opportunities that have arisen from then came because of that. There would be no Varsity House today. There would be no 20,000-square-foot gym. There would be no podcast. There would be no six-week transformation. There would be none of those products or any of those things if we hadn't become what we had in sports performance and we train football players first. Uh, number five is be seen and be yourself. Get out in your community. Make yourself known. Be the community guy. Be the gym dude in your community and go to every event and make friends and find the people that you connect with and that you feel like you're aligned with and make friends and be their real friend and offer them you know, your services and offer them your help and just be a normal person just like you would if you were trying to make a real friend outside of the gym community. Uh, uh, you know, Just because people are clients doesn't mean that they can't be awesome friends and good people too in your lives. I mean, there are a lot of good clients here, like Jeanette being one of them. Jeanette has become a really good friend. Jeanette's one of our oldest clients. She's super loyal. She's one of the nicest people in the world. She's become a very close friend of my wife's. She helped us tremendously, you know, uh, uh, when Adele was pregnant and stuff like that. She's always been super sweet to us, you know. And she's like become like a real friend, invites us out, and she's coming over to the house to see the baby, stuff like that. That's that's what I'm talking about. It does, it, and it's not weird. Like I was like, you want to be friends? You want to be like chasing her down? You know, it, it, it you know it, it happened organically over a whole bunch of years. Number six, ask for referrals. Take take a survey of all your clients. Make a list of all the thing. All take the ten best clients that you have, and then. Do like an extrapolation. You know, we'll, we'll, we're going to build your ideal avatar in a second, but, uh, you know, and, and, and figure exactly where they are, what they do, where they live, who they hang out with, you know, um, and, and, and start to create this picture that, that what these clients, and then ask them, like, hey, you know, my awesome client, but where's your friends? Right. Where's your wife? You got to make it <clears throat> with the referral, you have to make it really easy for, Say, yeah. um, you know, say I was trying to sell you to go to a restaurant. Right. Like, I have to make it super easy for you to where is the restaurant? What time are they open? What do they sell? Well, yeah. And so, like, so I have to be informed to yeah, tell yeah, you yeah. that. So yes. if you tell these people, like, yeah, tell your friends about the gym. Tell your friends about the gym. Okay, great. So they're like, Varsity House is awesome. All right, that, now what? No, tell you your know friends I mean? to show up Saturday at 10 o'clock for exactly. a Bring a Friend workout. That's different. Exactly. you gotta, you got to lead them to exactly what it you want. It has to be detailed and simple as hell for them to regurgitate. Yes. And, and, and like we, do, we, have, we, got a lot of, we have a whole referral kit coming out shortly. Um, hint, hint. But, and, but we'll, and we'll go over a whole bunch of ways to refer clients. But we do it all real passively. We don't, we don't hawk people for referrals. We referrals are a built-in process of doing business with us. It's built into our built into our onboard, built into becoming a new client, built into our client parties and things like that. And 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 when there is a really good client that's been with us for years, you know nothing goes further than you know, like you said, like Dan said, taking them out for lunch and having a real conversation. Hey, man, like you know, we're looking to get a couple more people just like you. I'm thinking about starting this like you know, man time barbell club or whatever it is. I'd like to get a couple more cool dudes. You know anybody like, you know, just look at Lance, for example, right? Like Lance is into, you know, Krav Maga, he's into shooting and stuff like that. You know, there's got to be, I don't know, there's got to be three, there's got to be two or three dudes that, that he comes in contact with, whether it's from, you know, the, the gun range or, 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 or the Krav Maga martial arts air, arena that 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 likes to train, you know what I mean. That maybe is similarly aligned to where he is. That values training, values his fitness and stuff like that. And it's like, hey man, like you know, or he's got some friends, you know. Or I know, you know, just like a lot of the clients here, all, all you know, 
friend active they go they they do they do 5k's 10k's marathons they compete they do whatever so uh uh you know doing your homework and asking the right clients for referrals is is by far the best way to get really good clients and uh and, and that's our number one way is asking for referrals so here's a few questions you can ask yourself when you're trying to decide who your ideal client should be and when you've answered all of them as completely as possible you will have a, a kind of an avatar for what you're looking for, and, and and you're ready to you know you know make some business gains and kind of start to dial in. You could see you know exactly you know what that client starts to look like. They literally start to come to life. Like I think our clients here, like when a client walks in the door, right? I can look at them and know almost instantly if they're a varsity house like avatar, like you know what I mean, and. and and you have a conversation with somebody, and almost everybody that comes here had some athletic background. Almost everybody that came here had a kid in the system, had a kid that came through here, or knows somebody who did. Uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Yamanera is a perfect example of that. You know, had a kid here for six six years ago. Been getting, been been trolling our emails for six years, and we finally hooked her into our transformation. You know what I mean? But that, but and she's the and power she, of email, and she's amazing, and she's and she's <laughs> awesome, and but she's an ideal client. Our ideal client are. You know, willing and wanting athletes, their families, and the community. So she fits into that thing. She comes. She works hard. She's super sweet. And she's there was positive. some familiarity. We of hadn't course. seen her in six years, but she knew that once upon a time we did right by her son, JB. JB loved training here. He went off to college. He no longer lives around here, but there was already a built-in trust factor. Yeah. So here's some questions to ask yourself. Write this down, gang, okay? we're gonna Obviously, we'll put it in the show notes with Trevor, but get your pens and pencils out, all right? Who do you want to work with? That's probably the biggest one. Like, who who do you enjoy the most? Like, what is it? Is it is it? You know, if you're a triathlete and you love doing triathlons, you should probably want to work with triathletes. And and you know, if you have to work with, you know, I don't know, bitchy rich housewives all day, you're probably going to be miserable. Uh, demographic info, gender, age, job, location. Like, where do these people live? What do they do? What's their you know you know I hate to say it, but what's their what's their social economic status, right? If you want to open up a high end Pilates studio that charges one hundred and twenty dollars an hour, you probably need a certain socio economic you know surroundings, right? You're not going to open that in in Compton, right? You know, unless you're selling crack out the back door. Sorry, sorry, Compton. I don't, I don't hate on the people in Compton. Uh, what are their needs? Is a good question, right? What What do people in the demographic that you want to work with? need. So again, we look at triathletes, it's like what type of fitness do those people need? You know, if we're looking at athletes like we were, we're looking at field sport athletes, what are the needs for that group, you know, and and how do we solve those problems? And that's the next question is what problems do they need solved, right? Like what can I do? What can I offer the group of people that I'm picking that's going to solve a problem that they have that they don't know that they already have, you know, that they don't already have? Which clients are the most profitable? That's an easy one, right? If you already have clients, you can run a, P- a test, like our POS system, literally tells you who spends the most money, and it's called the Big Spender Report. What? what? Right? I, love, I love printing the Big Spender <laughs> Report. Trevor's always at the top of the list, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> zeros. <laughs> Fucking guy robbing us blind, man. Right? But who, 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 you know, who, which clients are the most profitable? So if you look at those, if you have 50 clients and you look at your top five and your top five clients, I got five clients that are spending 5K a year and I got, you know, 20 clients that are only spending, the average is only 1,000. Well, what the hell are those people doing that they're buying so much? I better talk to those people, right? So like when we have a client here, we got a few clients that are spending 15, 20 grand a year. <laughs> I like to talk to them. What is it that makes us your go-to fitness provider, that you are willing and able to plunk down that cash, right? Because 15 grand is a lot of money for anyone, right? So if you value us and you believe in us so much that you're willing to spend that type of dough, I want to speak to you and I want to understand what it is that's that, that, that really is you know, the reason behind why you're doing it and how am I going to get more people like you? Do you know more people or you know, or, or uh, I got to find more like you? Uh, which of the clients? Which of the clients referred you the most? Right. So another great test is, you know, so some clients don't spend boatloads of dough, but they spread the gospel, right? 
and we got a bunch of those cronies here at the gym, right, where they, they, they rope in all their friends all the time. They don't spend boatloads of dough. They pay for their memberships, and they buy a lot. You know, they, they spend, you know, the, the yearly client value. They're spending about 3000 a year, which is great. You know what I mean? I'm not, you know, may, uh, uh, saying it's not. But they refer us, you know, a half a dozen clients a year, whereas you might have a whale who, you know, spends 10 15 grand, but doesn't refer you anybody. Right and, and and is maybe maybe he's just an introvert maybe he doesn't talk a lot so you can kind of talk to those two groups of people and see well what's making you refer and what is it that you love so much that that's that's allowing you to spend that type of money here those are the two real questions that we try to ask our clients uh, who do you have the strongest connection with you know what type of clients do you bond with right is it the is it the you know the men the women the hard workers the weightlifters right and here it's definitely the people who love lifting weights i think we all connect with the most as opposed to the uh, you know the cardio bunnies who are always doing tons of cardio we don't like those types right and uh <laughs> there's no cardio equipment here only a prowler and uh and, and you know who do you who do you bond with so like find a strong connection with and again you start to like narrow down your list so maybe i started with a list of 50 people by the time i get done answering these questions i have 10 really awesome people and those are the people I want to talk to. And last but not least is how many clients or customers do you really need? And this is an important business question because, and me and Dan have gone back on this personally as, as frequently as yesterday. You know, and, and, you know, Dan pops into my office sometimes like Cosmo Kramer from Seinfeld. You know, hey, hey, we got to do it. And, and it's like, I'm like, yo, chill out for two seconds. You got to give me, give me, build, give me a sentence with some adjectives and shit. Yeah, let me that know. sounds like you, Joe, coming into my oh, office. Oh, I do that. <laughs> well, after Dan storms into my office, I got to give it back to somebody. So I come st- storm into your office and I kick Hyde's chair when he's not looking. I kick him in the back, <laughs> right? And uh, but the reality is, is that you know, how many clients do we really need? And me and Dan have you know narrowed this down to a number that we think is is the right number. And that number can change, no question. Let's say you know if I build out this gym another 20,000 square feet maybe that number changes but but how many clients do you really need what end is um, uh, are you going to be happy with not only the the size of the gym the community itself the ability to manage the gym in its community and the money you're making for yourself I mean I think those are all really important questions that you have to ask you know so um, you know I, on the last episode we were talking to Josh a little bit and we said like look man there's no doubt that that you know, running uh, a if you if you got a ten million dollar business and it does two million dollars in profit, so that's twenty percent. Or you can scale that business to a hundred million, and it still does two million in profit, but now you're at two percent. I'll take the ten million dollar business any day of the week because that hundred million dollar business is a bitch to run, mm-hmm. right? I I went from a hundred employees to a thousand employees. You know what I mean? I went from a hundred problems. To a thousand problems, you know, and, and I went, you know, all, now you have all sorts of different things. So, you know, people look at what we're doing and and, and they say, oh, well, I want to open up a varsity house. I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, you know, there nothing comes without a cost, right? So growing the gym as we have has costed us something. And that cost has been, you know, time, money, management, you know, issues, things like that. And, and time, time being the biggest <laughs> one, and, and and so if we had gone back and answered all these questions earlier, and 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 dealt with our operational side of things earlier, I think we'd have a lot of this uh, 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 worked out already. You know what I mean? There's already been a lot of this process would already be done. Things would be a lot smoother. So, uh, uh, my closing statement to all of you is that. In as with everything we try to give you for the business of strength, whether it's through our mentorships or uh, uh, through our podcast and the stuff that we put out to the internet, it, it is really pre- preventative medicine, and, and that's that's really the best way that I can sum up uh, what we do here at the Business of Strength. It's trying to help prevent uh, the same mistakes that we made, and to give uh, uh, strength entrepreneurs, gym owners, and coaches some options as to you know other avenues that they might take, and that if you plan carefully and you spend time working on the business now, later, you will have to spend a lot less time working on the little tiny details. And, and those things will start to come into focus. So, And one of those key things is finding your ideal client and just making sure that you get the right people in your gym so that you don't have to work backwards. So you don't have to have 200 people and be like, man, 
I hate 50 of these people. I can't stand them. I, I hate everything they're about. I don't want anything to do with them. And you have 200 people that you absolutely love and want to be a part of that you can that you would literally have over your house for a barbecue and, and, and you could honestly have a great conversation with every person. So that is the key. That is another uh, 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 awesome tip from me and Dan. We are done. We are dropped the mic. Lotus Place. Peace out. Peace out, gang. The business of strength powered by Varsity House Gym. Turn your passion into your profession and learn how to run a world-class business. Be sure to visit us at www.strengthentrepreneurs.com to learn more. And as always, at varsityhousegym.com. Become unstoppable.